Welcome, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Ooh. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> and welcome back, uh, and gratitude to Just and Nadja and everyone who has brought this conference into being, and to each of you uh, who contributes to it in your own ways. Uh, it's very inspiring to be a part of this uh, very open and courageous and visionary and competent uh, group of people. Uh, I think this is one of the few scientific conferences I've been at where I can say uh, namaste. <laughs> like I honor the transcendental depths within each of you. Okay, uh, briefly acknowledge our team at Hopkins. I want to begin the presentation just with a bit of a preface. I call it Four Fundamental Understandings on the Present Frontier of Knowledge. First point is that these psychedelic substances provide access to an incredibly vast and rich uh, domain or many domains within consciousness. And um, I don't think it makes any sense at this point to talk or write about the psychedelic experience unless you want to define very carefully what you mean in your article by that. Um, as you all probably know, there are changes in sensory perception with very low dosage. Uh, there's experiences of panic, paranoia, confusion that are very rare in the uh, well-conducted research world, uh, but quite common when people use these substances without knowing how to navigate in their own internal worlds. There's the realm of personal psychodynamic content, age regression, guilt, grief, anger, sorting out interpersonal conflicts, life traumas, uh, and also the potential healing and resolution of all that. Uh, none of that we would usually describe as religious or spiritual, uh, but incredibly effective and helpful. Then there's the realm of awe-inspiring visions, encounter with archetypes, gods, goddesses, gemstones, landscapes, ancient civilizations, you name it. Uh, and beyond that, the realm of unitive mystical consciousness. And I'll be concentrating primarily in these latter two categories today. Second basic tenet of, of knowledge we have at this point is that there are three factors of critical importance, set, setting, and dosage. Uh, we're past the days of someone, anyone, using the, a psychedelic substance as a purely chemotherapeutic agent. We'll just give the drug to you and see what happens. I think from what we now know, we would say that was unethical. Set, I hope I'm not blocking your view here. Uh, I like to define as, uh, unconditional trust insofar as it's possible to establish that in the time available. Uh, but one way to try to put that into words, it's entrusting your being to the care of something or someone more fu fundamental. For people who have a, a religious orientation, uh, if you can see that in the context of devotion to uh, something greater than yourself, I think that's very helpful. Um, I like to emphasize choice. Um, the ideal psychological set is more than simply being passive. Uh, 
or simply being receptive, sort of like lying down while a steamroller uh, uh, <laughs> goes over you. It entails kind of a conscious decision that in this setting with these people, with the preparation I've had, uh, with my knowledge of the purity and the, the proper dosage of this substance, et cetera, et cetera, I choose to be out of control, to unconditionally trust. So it comes out of a strong ego making a choice rather than a, a weak ego. Qualities of openness, honesty, curiosity, courage to explore, to confront, to suffer, to learn, to receive, uh, to relinquish control, to allow experiencing beyond the usual levels of understanding. Uh, it takes a lot of trust. But when you can establish that with someone as deeply as possible and then provide the psychedelic substance, the experience is much more likely to be beneficial. The setting, of course, needs to be safe, confidential. It's nice if it's aesthetically pleasant. Um, skilled choice of music, I could talk about that for five hours, but I won't. <laughs> uh, and the interpersonal setting, empathic, respectful, genuine, focused, non-anxious, competent, that uh, the person who is your guide whether or not that person has taken psychedelic drugs is centered and present and appreciative of the potential value of other states of consciousness. Uh, you may have seen this before. This is our, la we have two labs now at Hopkins. This is our first one. Uh, and you can see how it's uh, created as a very kind of pleasant living room situation. Uh, we have some symbols of different uh, world religions and we, we try to represent them all. <laughs> so uh, uh, you can see the symbol of the rose. That's a tradition that goes way back to uh, work with alcoholics in Saskatchewan and psychedelic centers. Most research projects have maintained that. It's, you know, that there's always a fresh rosebud in the room. And it often becomes a, a very helpful focus in the transition from coming up from under headphones and eye shade to open-eyed interaction with the room as before you go to the bathroom or something to be able to uh, um, just meditate on it for a moment. It's a beautiful... Uh, part of the setting itself. And then just the dosage, uh, to acknowledge the importance of dosage, it seems to be influenced by resistance psychologically as the capacity to manifest trust, courage, and openness, and many factors genetic and life experience-wise may feed into that. Um, and we know, of course, that there's a certain threshold for most people that has to be reached in dosage before the transcendental experiences become possible. Although, let it be noted, we have to remember there are some people who have, who have these profound experiences with no drug at all, that they seem to be, you know, intrinsic to the human organism. And... Um, People are fond of commenting that uh, supposedly uh, somewhere in our bodies, perhaps lung tissue, we do produce di dimethyltryptamine, huh? albeit in minute doses, and who knows how our endogenous chemistry may contribute to some of these profound experiences. So sometimes people have very profound experiences with very low dosage or no dosage at all. Third basic point is that the different major psychedelic substances appear to provide access 
to a similar, if not identical, range of experiential content. That the experiences are not in the drug, if you will, but they're in the human mind. Um, particular molecules do not appear to cause experience uh, specific content, uh, but rather provide access to existing spiritual processes. And here's a great uh, research project for someone's dissertation. Um, I would hypothesize if you did a double-blind study of uh, ayahuasca, pharmacowasca, and psilocybin, for example, so you didn't know which was which, I would predict there would be just as many anacondas and panthers in the psilocybin group <laughs> as in the ayahuasca group, but I could be wrong. <laughs> uh, there's just this incredibly rich, vast realm of imagery and experiences that uh, make their uh, appearance. And the fourth basic introductory point here is that when administered in accordance with our present knowledge, meaningful processes, philosophers call it entelechy, become safely manifested. Although specific phenomenology cannot be known in advance, it is no longer reasonable to consider the content that becomes manifested in a particular well-conducted psychedelic session as unpredictable, capricious, random, or dangerous. When interpersonally grounded within a supportive set and setting, the emotions and symbolic processes experienced tend to be intrinsically meaningful and therapeutic, often indicating a creative choreography or entelechy within consciousness. Um, you're f familiar, especially in the peyote and ayahuasca traditions, uh, the view that the sacrament is the teacher. And you kind of, when you take it, you're the student who's willing to learn, whether it's a pleasant or a difficult lesson, but there's an appreciation for a wisdom within the psyche. Uh, just to touch in psychotherapy, of course, there's the low-dose psycholytic therapy that was very prevalent in Europe back in the uh, uh, late 50s and 60s, uh, kind of the focus on the Jungian personal unconscious, if you will. The psychedelic that began, began in Canada and was used in the United States primarily aiming at the transcendental experiences. Uh, and then there's this wonderful word, psychodolytic, that was uh, coined by Hemo, or GW, Aronson Hine, who just lived a few miles from here in uh, Adervain, a suburb of, of Amsterdam. And uh, unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but you know, it's not a no-brainer by, by saying, why not do both? <laughs> you know? And so he created a clinic. He actually built it from the ground in Adervain um, that had small rooms for psycholytic therapy and then this big, wonderful room with floor-to-ceiling windows and a pond with swans floating on it and, and all for psychedelic sessions and he would give a series of psycholytic sessions to his, he didn't call them patients, they were his guests. And then when he felt they were ready, he would lead them into the, the psychedelic realm and give them a higher dose, aiming at a mystical experience. And he felt the best treatment included both. I, I, I don't know if anyone knows if that clinic still exists or what's going on there, but, uh, it's, it's right next door. Uh, this is just more detail of psychodynamic experience. Okay, when we talk about transcendental experiences, I like to divide it into two categories. 
the uh, visionary archetypal and the unitive mystical. And the distinction, pedantic as it may be, is that in the visionary archetypal, there's still some sense of the individual self as the observer, the ego, that's looking at something, approaching something, being inspired by something, interacting with something. But the, the subject-object dichotomy of perception is, is still present to some extent. Where in the unitive mystical consciousness, it's sort of like the Hindu drop of water merger, merging with the ocean of Brahman, and the, the, there's a complete kind of death and rebirth uh, cycle occurring. Uh, since I'm not going to give you a lot of statistics, I'll give you some art. <laughs> and uh, in, in the journey within consciousness, it's amazing how often the mental imagery is similar to uh, Gothic architecture or uh, Islamic uh, domes. Um, and there's a sense of moving through one space, almost as if you were a bird flying and into another and into another and into another. Um, mandalic forms. This is a, a painting I just brought back from Bali of Shiva. Uh, it's called the divine compass, but the idea like it can draw you in and through the center. Uh, classic rose window imagery, uh, Dome of St. Peter's in Rome. This is a, a great mosque. And these images always make me think of Jeremy Narby's uh, uh, theories. I, I hope most of you know his book, um, uh, Cosmic Serpent. Cosmic Serpent. The Cosmic Serpent, right. And he has this schizophrenic sounding hypothesis that uh, what we are seeing in these experiences with eyes closed are, are literally neuronal or uh, um, microscopic cellular processes. And that just as we have externally oriented uh, senses, we have an internally oriented uh, perceptual system that can actually uh, perceive uh, reality in a, another framework. And, you know, this kind of does look like the fovea of the eye or the, uh, some end of a neuron, who knows? But it's a fascinating uh, way to think. You know, the reality is uh, we really don't know what we are yet. You know? <laughs> and we can dissect a lot of brains, but we don't find consciousness. And the <coughs> consciousness itself is still a, an incredible mystery. We know that we are, uh, and we know that not only in psychedelic states, but in normal nocturnal dreaming, that we see all kinds of things with our eyes closed. But what in the world is really going on? I'd like to think that's a scientific frontier and not solely the realm of philosophers. Okay, the nature and definition of mystical consciousness. Uh, scientifically, to decide, did this person have a mystical experience or not? We look at the report, the questionnaires, and we look for these six categories unity, transcendence of time and space, intuitive knowledge, sacredness, deeply felt positive mood, and ineffability and paradoxicality. And uh, I'll take the luxury of uh, taking you a bit more deeply into these categories than Roland was able to do in the time he had on Monday. Uh, these categories go back to my friend Walter Pankey, uh, who did the Good Friday study and it was part of his dissertation. Unity seems to be approached in either of two ways, one with closed eyes, kind of going deeper and deeper into an internal visionary world, uh, 
external unity with open eyes through perception, uh, where it feels as though the perceiver and the perceived uh, become one somehow. I think Alfred North Whitehead was, uh, someone did a, a program uh, yesterday on Whitehead. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to be there. But I think he was on the right track of uh, uh, trying to express uh, kind of an ultimate unity uh, through perception. Transcendence of time and space. What's so remarkable about this category it, is that it is not only that the person is not aware of the passage of time or sensitive to space, but people make these claims of having been outside of time, as if they could look back on history. You know, pretty awesome. Uh, um, I think it, it's what in religious language we call eternity or infinity in mathematical language. And it is a state of consciousness that's very frequently um, reported. Then intuitive knowledge. Uh, in my book, uh, which I hope some of you will, if not all of you, will eventually find. The title of the book is Sacred Knowledge, Psychedelics and Religious Experiences. And I chose that title because I wanted to focus on the intuitive knowledge of these states. That mystical experiences are much more than kind of glorious emotion, not to devalue glorious emotion, but it also, they also bring with them knowledge. Knowledge that different people from different cultures and throughout history seem to report the same basic themes. Um, uh, William James in the varieties of religious experience called it the noetic quality of mystical experiences. And so we say, well, what do you know, you know? And the most common way it gets expressed is, well, that the, the spiritual dimension is really real, you know? Uh, Teilhard de Chardin, the uh, uh, Jesuit uh, man who wrote the um, phenomenon of man and so on, uh, Su su suggest that we are all spiritual beings who right now are having physical or human experiences, which is just kind of a nice perspective. Um, eternity, it, um, which carries with it uh, a sense of immortality, intuitively. Uh, the feeling that consciousness is indestructible. Now, we can talk, you know, that could be a great delusion, but it seems blatantly obvious when you're in that state of consciousness. Um, and what's most impressive is in very seriously ill cancer patients who have that experience, it seems to remove the fear of death. And the way it removes it is fascinating because it is not people who lose their fear of death don't want to hasten the death, usually. They want to live the time they have as fully and richly as possible. Uh, but the fear of death becomes replaced with sort of a curiosity about death. You know, almost as, yeah, eventually I'm going to have this experience that everyone who's ever been born has had. I wonder what it'll be like, you know? Uh, I wish I could come back and tell you, but I can't, you know? Um, but the anxiety vanishes. Another very common intuitive insight is the interrelatedness of life, the brotherhood of man, uh, the unity of humankind, the net of Indra in Hinduism, uh, this network of being connected with one another, Gaia, uh, through within consciousness. 
And perhaps one of the most profound insights is uh, what people might call the primacy of love. You know, this sounds so poetic, I almost feel like I should apologize for saying this in a scientific conference. But, but it's, it's what uh, Dante at the end of the Divine Comedy says, that uh, ultimately it is love that moves the sun and other stars. Or that the ultimate nature of the energy that makes up reality is love. Poetic, hey? Eh? Beauty. And this is part of the power of these experiences, especially for uh, addicts and people who have an abundance of, of feelings of failure and uh, just having messed up their lives, that these states of consciousness and the mental imagery surrounding them often are just so exquisitely beautiful, both visually and uh, in terms of the way they unfold, the wisdom with which they present themselves, that afterwards you can't view yourself as worthless anymore. You know, you just, it won't work. You know, all of that incredible magnificence was somehow found in the depths of my own mind. So it becomes a fulcrum for behavioral change. And then the theme of uh, that consciousness has a, an intellecty, a meaningful unfolding, as I mentioned. The domain of sacredness, uh, some people might prefer to call it awesomeness. Or, uh, it's sort of what I think people feel when you walk into the nave of a high nave of a Gothic cathedral or something, you just intuitively uh, lower your voice, whether you're, you consider yourself a believer in any particular religious framework or not, There's, or when you're holding a newborn child or watching a beautiful sunset. There's just something that's intrinsically sacred that is intuitively sensed, and it's like that as these mystical states open up. Um, on the part of the unitive consciousness is, is this awareness that as you go deeper and deeper and deeper, the world does not become more scary and surreal, but it starts to feel more and more familiar. So people say, oh yeah, I remember, I was here before or so they say, or there's a sense of being welcomed as if these deeper levels of reality have been there waiting for you to finally uh, take a journey from the world of time to come home for a few hours before you go back. But it, there's a sense of homecoming, of feeling safe. And that's why so many of the cancer patients um, will say, well, you know, I, I don't know if, uh, I, I still don't know about, phys, about personal immortality, whether my little ego will continue to exist in one way or another. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But that's not important anymore. But there's a sense that uh, all is well in the universe in spite of the reality of death. And that frees up people to, to live more fully. Deeply felt positive mood, joy, peace, love, purity. Uh, some people even feel like joy is almost uh, adolescent. It's, it's just the peace, it's the centeredness, it's the knowledge that all is well. And then ineffability, our research volunteers are good sports. They promised to write a research report of what they experienced. And to my knowledge, everyone has, but they all do it kicking and screaming, kind of saying like, this is really a, a 
quite an impossible task you're asking me to do. So there's inevitably a paragraph of, you know, I'm doing this, but there's no way I can really adequately put this into words. Um, and one way I, I like to <laughs> uh, illustrate that, sounds corny, but it, if you imagine a, um, a caveman who's transported to the center of a major city, and all of a sudden he sees subways and airplanes and uh, uh, skyscrapers and cell phones and whatever, and then he's, he's back in his cave, and his wife says, Gord, what did you experience? <laughs> all he can say is kind of, ah, uh, <laughs> it was big, it was <laughs> impressive. But he, he doesn't have the vocabulary of skyscraper, cell phone, etc. you know? And it's similar in these mystical states uh, that there is an intuitive sense of structure and order and meaning. It's not just chaos. But, but you don't begin to have the language. You feel like we haven't evolved. Language itself hasn't evolved far enough to talk about. Maybe if you know Sanskrit, you have a few more words, you know, but at least English is really limited. Um, and the other aspect is this, what we call paradoxicality, big academic word. But it's that when people try to write a description, they inevitably c contradict themselves. You know, I died, but I've never been so alive. Uh, the ultimate was beyond the personal, but it was the ultimate source of love and was more personal than anything I ever knew. Uh, I was in my body, but I was out of my body. Uh, God was one, but God contained everything that is, and so on. And you can read those reports and just say, oh, what gibberish, he's contradicting himself all over the place. But what's happening, I think, is that the, these paradoxes are trying to be expressed, that the truth is both and rather than either or, and language just is incapable of capturing it. The other problem with language is the lang structure of language itself. It has a, a, a subject and a predicate, a temporal sequence. And some of this experience, these experiences are outside of time. And language just, just doesn't work. So we have the line in the sacred Taoist scripture, the Tao Te Ching, those who know do not speak. Those who speak do not know, you know? Or uh, Tuchev, a Russian poet who says, in trying to describe mystical states, quote, a word that's spoken is a lie, which makes it hard to do science. <laughs> so in summary, what we mean by mystical experience is all of this, unity, transcendence of time and space, intuitive knowledge, sacredness, deeply felt positive mood, ineffability, and paradoxicality. And uh, at lunch, uh, I was talking of how these experiences seem accessible to anyone. Uh, like they, they seem to be just part of the way consciousness is structured. And the people who may have trouble letting go, given adequate set, setting, and dosage, are people, whether they label themselves as atheist or whether they label themselves as uh, very rigidly religious in one framework or another, uh, if you want to kind of prove a point, it's hard to let go because that's an agenda of the ego. But anyone who's a genuine skeptic uh, agnostic, who is just, well, I'm willing to experience anything, you know, lead me there and I'll, I'll, I'll experience it and then I'll think about it. Those people are wonderful volunteers and they're very likely to have mystical experiences. Theoretical constructs that try to deal with mystical consciousness 
uh, our friend Sigmund Freud had a friend. Well, Freud doesn't say he was a friend, but Roland says, says Freud was his friend. <laughs> Uh, Ro Romain Roland was kind of a poet mystic that Freud would apparently uh, have coffee with now and then. And um, uh, R Romain would try to describe his mystical experiences to Freud. And uh, Freud just couldn't find those experiences in his own mind. He, he was busy uh, working with cocaine at the time. Uh, so Freud called it the oceanic feeling, but in civiliz and he thought it was probably a memory of nursing at the breast as an infant. But even he, in civilization and dis its discontents, says there may be something else wrapped in obscurity. You know, he couldn't get to it, but he sensed maybe it, there was something more. Jung, of course, called it the transcendent function and wrote about the collective unconscious. Um, there's a wonderful book by Scott Hill out there uh, on Jung and psychedelics for those who, of you who are Jungian. Um, the collective unconscious, of course, tends to be the symbolic area that can be so rich and convoluted with archetypes in astrology that you can almost get lost in there. I, I would love to give Jung a good psychedelic experience and help him kind of sense the pure, clean transcend, transcendence beyond all the imagery. Karl Jaspers, German philosopher, psychiatrist, uh, of course, wrote about transcendence and what he called the, the unbedingte Forderung, the uh, unconditioned imperative, this idea that deep within the psyche there is this thing called love. And when you remove the barriers, the love emerges, sort of like a, an underground spring that heals people. It's a wonderful concept. And Bion, uh, who's often viewed as a uh, secular mystic, uh, who died not long ago, talked about God as O, and kept referring f to the deep and formless infinite from Milton's Paradise Lost. Uh, but he really acknowledged this dimension of experience without devaluing it uh, in the world of psychiatry. So, are these mystical insights pure ontological knowledge? Or is it one wonderful delusion? Um, I think everyone has to make that decision for themselves. You know, you can, you can make arguments about how these states appear in different cultures and are recorded throughout history. Um, but ultimately, I think it's a personal judgment. It's sort of like, do you really love your wife or your kids? You know, you kind of decide if you trust that experience. But I like to uh, go with brag pragmatism with William James. Um, so the question is, what good are these experiences? Uh, they certainly do not certify sainthood. Uh, the new knowledge and perspectives that occur require continued integration. They include changes in self-concept and self-worth, new understandings of the relationship of the self to others, in the universe. They entail an enhanced sense of belonging and interconnectedness, a loss of estrangement, of being at home. Especially for people with a lot of guilt, it uh, provides a certainty of acceptance, forgiveness, inner resources, the freedom to change behavior. Um, for those in Alcoholics Anonymous or whatever, I mean, this is the higher power and it's real. Loss of fear of death, especially valuable for people who are critically ill. And just pure awe at the miracle of life itself. Increased gratitude. The Buddhists talk about uh, that how fortunately, 
how fortunate we are to be having, quote, one precious human life. You know, don't take it for granted. It doesn't happen very often. And there's more of a sense of that freshness of being, of just being thankful to be having this adventure probably less than 100 years, but here we are. Isn't that great, you know? Uh, Houston Smith, uh, uh, my, one of my beloved mentors, who I never actually studied with, but he's been a friend a long time, uh, who made the distinction between religious experiences and religious lives and the need to integrate. Few quick thoughts on ways to facilitate integration. Uh, it's very valuable to write up these experiences, regardless of how they occur. Uh, it becomes like a, a document you can refer back to year after year after year and help you remember what happened. Sharing with others, kind of bringing the experience into language, imperfect as language is, but it helps to find some concepts, some words, to point towards it. Initiating new forms of behavior, you know, there's often these insights, oh, I should make contact with my estranged relative. Afterwards, do it. <laughs> you know, don't just think about doing it. And it's kind of implementing these insights in this world that seems profoundly therapeutic. Personal meditative disciplines of whatever kind can be incredibly helpful, and a general openness, sensitivity to what is emerging within. We often uh, talk about, well, what am I going to do with a mystical experience, you know? Uh, a deeper question may almost be, what is the mystical experience going to do with you? And there's a sense, and we find this in uh, some of our volunteers, our first, first volunteers from 16 years ago, that they claim there is still integration and insight and growth occurring, like they're still mining the gold from that few hours of that one day. And uh, it works within you. Uh, data, for if you want data, there's my thesis from years ago, where I gave DPT to a bunch of cancer patients and then uh, divided post hoc those who had mystical experiences and those who didn't, and those who had the mystical experiences reported greater changes in capacity for intimate contact and existentiality and so on. And then our as yet unpublished paper, both ours and the one from New York, uh, which will be coming out, hopefully within the year, uh, of the uh, value of these experiences for people with cancer diagnoses. Uh, frontiers of research, efficacy of different styles of therapy, in, and it's, there's no limit to research projects that can be done with different drugs in different contexts, with different forms of psychological distress, uh, the continuing exploration of biochemical neuroimaging, other physiological, psychophysiological correlates. An important area is that these drugs aren't only of value in treatment, in medical treatment, but they have incredible value in education, as Ken Tupper, who is here, called our attention to some time ago. And um, one of the studies Roland and I are doing right now is with uh, full-time professional religious leaders, seeing if this can, a mystical experience can really enrich the effectiveness of, of their ministry, regardless of which world religion they may represent. Or training of psychiatrists and psychologists, if you really want to experientially understand how the human mind works, how paranoia gets generated, what inner resources there are within us. This is a valuable educational tool as well as a, a treatment tool. Um, and then the whole area of what Bob Jesse calls using psychedelics for the betterment of well people, you know, of, of helping people 
become more self-actualized, more compassionate, more tolerant. Uh, and of course, the great frontier of the mystery of consciousness. Galileo, just to remind us that we may be on the threshold of a whole new paradigm change in, in how we understand reality and the nature of consciousness. Uh, Abe Maslow, one of my mentors who uh, made the distinction between science that limits itself to what it can easily measure and control and what he would call true science, which is pushing the, the boundaries of human knowledge. Uh, and clearly this is where uh, uh, true science has many opportunities. We need to develop new concepts, new words, new research strategies, uh, but let's not be afraid of it. The Dalai Lama, the view that all mental processes are necessarily physical processes is a metaphysical assumption, not a scientific fact. Causation and correlation are two separate things, and let's not underestimate the mystery of consciousness. And good old Kalyasper's man is basically more than he knows or ever can know of himself. And I think that's a good place to stop. So we are late a little, but we still have some space for questions. Okay, this Two is a very questions maybe okay though. This Thanks. is a very short one. Thank you so much for this excellent presentation and speech. Um, practically, how do you see, sir, this paradigm shift happening uh, in practice in future? That's a good question. I'd like to, I'd like to hear your answer to that yeah, one. <laughs> I like to write about the paradigm shift, you know, that, and I use, the, I like to refer to Bert Brecht's play Galileo, uh, where uh, the earth is flat, uh, the, the uh, firmament has epicycles, the stars move in very irregular patterns across. Um, if on a test you say that the Earth is not the center of the universe, you flunk, you know? Um, and uh, obviously we've moved away from that view of the world, but we still talk about sun rises and sunsets, you know? It, it takes a few hundred years. We, why don't we talk about the beautiful Earth turn we had this morning, you know? But similarly, uh, if you take this research seriously, we may, our minds can function in different ways in terms of time and space and substance and cause and effect. Uh, and we're just beginning to comprehend some of the capabilities that we have. And with that may come some shift in how we understand the nature of reality itself. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk, uh, especially the question whether all these hallucinations are true or not. And you very wisely said that we should judge that for ourselves, but at the same time, it was also clear from your speech that at least you believe there is some truth in it, at least some wisdom. And I was thinking of one of the earlier LSD researchers in the Netherlands, Professor Jan Bastiaans, who dis, did LSD research with Holocaust survivors yes. in a therape therapeutic setting. And um, one of the reasons why his work got a bad name, because these people came up with memories that were actually said not to be true at all. So would you please comment on that? Yes, uh, personally I, uh, I'd want to edit out the word hallucination 
because true hallucinations are extremely rare, uh, i.e. seeing something and thinking other people might see the same thing. You know, it, it's almost like dreaming while you're awake, perhaps, but you know that others, you maintain critical distance. And uh, it, that, so the question is, does the mental imagery that is unfolding have meaning? You know, uh, is it teaching you something? Uh, is it leading you somewhere worthwhile? And uh, in a, usually in a well-grounded um, therapeutic setting, yes, the answer would be yes, that it's not just m meaningless imagery, but it's teaching you something, reflecting something, leading you somewhere. And why do you think these people came up with stories that were not true? These people that uh, Bastian's researched? Um, I'm not familiar of, you know, stories that weren't true. It, there is a storytelling uh, ability of all great novelists, you know, that may emerge in these stories, in these experiences that may not be literally true historically, mm -hmm. but they may, the content of the story uh, experientially okay. may be true. So actually you should view those stories from a different angle. Perhaps, okay. yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have to change now. Yeah, thank you very much, Bill, for your competent presentation.